Thank you, Tony. I just said to David Gregory that I'm getting a better introduction than he will. <laughs> but it is a, a pleasure for me to have the chance to introduce today's distinguished speaker, who's one of our nation's most experienced political reporters and the author of How is Your Faith? An Unlikely Spiritual Journey. But before I begin, I want to thank my colleagues at Tisch College, especially Jess Burns, for their hard work in putting together today's event. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the Tufts Film and Media Studies Program, and its director, Julie Dobrow, and Tufts Hillel, and its executive director, Rabbi Jeff Summit. Uh, as the president said, today's forum kicks off the spring semester lineup of the Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series, which brings to campus leaders from a variety of fields to engage with the Tufts community on important current issues. On April 5th, we will welcome to campus Congressman John Lewis, who marched alongside Martin Luther King, was a leading figure in the Civil Rights Movement. The following week, on April 13th, I hope you'll join us for a forum on how to win elections, featuring David Axelrod, who ran both of President Obama's successful presidential campaigns in 2008 and 2012, and Tufts alumna Beth Myers, a senior strategist in both of Mitt Romney's presidential campaigns. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to a talk by yet another former jumbo, Max Finberg, who is the director of AmeriCorps Vista. He will be on campus this Monday, February 22nd at 3.30 p.m. in Dowling 745. It's no coincidence that leaders like Max Finberg and Beth Myers, as well as former Senator Scott Brown and journalist Matt Bai, all of whom are alumnus, alumni of this university, uh, have spent their careers advancing the public good through politics and public service or through vigorous reporting on public issues. As President Monaco often says, civic engagement and social impact are part of the jumbo DNA, and Tisch College is the repository of those genes. This speaker series is one of many ways we are preparing the next generation of informed and engaged students on whom we are counting to improve our civic life and our democracy. Through leadership programs, internships, courses, and other educational efforts, both inside and outside of the classroom, we help students acquire the values, the knowledge, and the skills that they will need to address the most challenging problems facing communities, nations, and the world. In addition, our researchers are among the nation's leading authorities on the civic and political engagement of young people. And through this election, throughout this election season, they are publishing their research findings and their unique analyses of how youth in general and college students specifically are shaping the 2016 election. I suggest you all go to the website civicyouth.org. Um, you can follow the best and most up-to-date analyses about how millennial voters are shaping our politics. We also promote a culture of civic engagement in higher education by sharing best practices that colleges and universities can use to prepare students not only for the job market, but to participate in our democracy as well. We're pursuing this mission at a critical time when civic and democratic institutions are imperiled by anger and cynicism and hyperpartisanship. And some like to lay blame for these problems at the feet of the news media, especially for its coverage of politics. But at its best, a strong, impartial, and probing press is one of the most vital elements in any democracy. It has certainly played this role in American democracy as the founding fathers themselves recognized when they enshrined freedom of the past press in the First Amendment of the Constitution. Today's guest represents the best in political reporting, and I imagine he has also witnessed some of the worst. David Gregory's career as a journalist began at a local television station in Arizona when he was 18 years old. It eventually took him to the White House and to the anchor's chair at one of the nation's most respected news programs, Meet the Press. During nearly two decades at NBC News, David covered the trials of O.J. Simpson and Timothy McVeigh, 
as well as other breaking news across the country and around the world. He was a key participant in election night coverage that spanned four presidential campaigns and is NBC's chief White House correspondent during the entire, entire presidency of George W. Bush, he earned a reputation as one of the toughest questioners in the press corps. Beginning in 2008, David served for six years as moderator of Meet the Press, the country's preeminent political talk show. There, he conducted a string of exclusive news-making interviews, including a sit-down with Vice President Joe Biden, which was largely credited with shifting the Obama administration's stance on gay marriage. Today, David is a regular political analyst on television and radio, and he will soon return to interviewing newsmakers on a new podcast. But David Gregory's professional journey is only part of his story. The other part, which he reveals in his recent book, is just as interesting and perhaps more important. In recent years, the man who made a career out of asking tough questions of world leaders has asked himself an even tougher one and set about trying to find the answer. The resulting memoir, How's Your Faith? An Unlikely Spiritual Journey, provides a remarkably revealing insight into David's relationship with Judaism, with himself, and with the people around him. As the Washington Post wrote in its review, How's Your Faith is a thoughtful, introspective, and moving account of Gregory's life, family, and beliefs, including his struggles with his mother's alcoholism, with interface marriage, with anger, with God. This is a book for seekers of faith, not fame. After reading the book once, I've gone back to it because I was struck by how much wisdom could be gleaned, regardless of one's beliefs, from David's candid and forthright account of grappling with the role of faith in his own life. And for those who draw a sense of duty to others and to improving the world from their faith, David's book has special relevance that connects to our work at Tisch College and to Tufts DNA. We're pleased to welcome David Gregory to discuss faith, journalism, and politics and connections among all three. I will start the conversation by asking a few questions and then we'll open it up to all of you. So please welcome David Gregory. I can't even work with the microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. <clears throat> Too loud? Okay. Welcome, David. Thank you. Great We're, to be here. Thanks, delighted. thanks, everyone, for coming. So uh, you conducted interviews for a living, and you were really good at it. <laughs> so as I begin to interview you, what advice do you have for me <laughs> about a good interview? <laughs> it's always important to listen. It's one of the things I, listen, I learned early on, which is you want to try to be present in the moment, which is a great, I think it's great advice for the rest of our lives as well, but to really be present because things can happen that may not, you may not expect and sometimes the most obvious, most obvious uh, question emerges uh, and, and revealing answers. For instance, you mentioned Vice President Biden. I never intended to ask him about gay marriage during that interview. It was something that we'd asked about a lot, but we had decided not to in this case. And he ended up talking about social issues and Republicans, and so I said, well, you bring that up, and so we got into it. So when I first in, in, invited you to join our Distinguished Speaker Series, I just assumed that we talk about presidential politics. And then I read your book, and I realized we'd be discussing other things. But uh, if you don't mind, what do you make of this year's presidential campaign? Well, I think you know we can get into the nitty gritty if you like and kind of map things out. But I think it's important to remember that campaigns are a real snapshot of where the country is. And I think campaigns are important because they're not only about the snapshot, but they try to capture where it is that the country wants to go, what individuals aspire to for the country. And I think the snapshot is one of not just anxiety, not just frustration, but deep anger with government not delivering. So I think there's more and more people, and I think this is true among liberals and conservatives, who feel left out. On the right, it's not just uh, anger about the size and the scope of government. 
But I really think it's uh, conservatives who are angry at Republicans, Republican leaders who they think have failed them and have failed to stop the slide in the country from their point of view. So you can go back to the Ross Perot voter in the early 90s, and that voter uh, has really never found his or her way back into the political system, feels left out. And I think what the left and the right share is that sense, I think on the left there's a sense of disappointment about Obama, that he's not progressive enough. Um, you see that kind of flashpoint around the economy, certainly, and around uh, big institutions like Wall Street. But I think it's big institutions generally. I think that there's a lot of people, particularly young people, who just don't believe that institutions can be trusted. Media, government, financial industry, big business generally. Uh, and, and then there are even older people who feel that, that the, the system is rigged to only help the powerful and that there's a lot of people who are left out. So I think we're seeing all of this now and we're seeing a kind of desperation among, among enough voters who feel like, hey, Let's do something really rash. And that's how you get a Donald Trump. That's how you get a kind of you know, nativist, isolationist, vulgar, brash, very media savvy, and brilliant public person who can capture all of that and say what people are really thinking and to say it without any fear of consequence. I mean, you don't take on the pope as he did today, uh, you know, you, unless you, you just don't care what the consequences are. So, the, so my overall view is that's the mood. I think we're barreling towards something truly unpredictable on the right. But I think Trump could absolutely get the nomination, and I was certainly among those who was dismissive of that. I think the left is falling into line a little bit more. I think that uh, there's a new poll, Wall Street Journal poll, that has... Uh, Hillary's support slipping as more women are going over to Sanders. Um, I just don't see him being there in the end, um, but I think the right is much less predictable. There are some people who observe that this election is disruptive in an unprecedented fashion, although I have argued that presidential elections are inherently disruptive, and I'm old enough to remember 1968 when a sitting president was forced right. to, not to run for re-election by somebody who named Eugene McCarthy, who was, um, and then 1980, when the country took a decided shift, or 92, when the Democrats returned to the White House for the first time in 25 years. Is this election that unique, or is it, is it, are we seeing something that plays out every four or eight years? No, I think this is unique because of the depth of the anger and of the anxiety and a kind of brokenness both in the political system but also in uh, government. But I don't think those things are unprecedented. I mean, I think what's different is that, you know, there's a wonderful book that I read recently by Rick Perlstein called Nixon Land. And it was about this kind of reaction to the civil rights era um, where the silent majority comes from. Uh, you know, the idea that whether it was the divisions over Vietnam or over civil rights that the country was kind of cleaving in two. And I don't know that, that, that um, I, for one, discern that as uh, is, is going on right now. But, but I think that, the, that America is changing rapidly. Our workforce is changing. Technology is, is so disruptive. We see disruptions uh, in business. We see it in... Um, in education, um, and we see it socially so importantly. There's a kind of new racial awakening in, in, in parts of the country because technology ushers in a greater awareness of, of police misconduct, for an example. Um, and you see gay rights on the march moving very quickly. So I think there is, for a lot of people in America, a sense that the country's moving in this direction inexorably in a certain way. And where are they? Are they being left behind? Whether it's what's happening socially or what's happening in terms of America and the world, you have these differences between where America is going and where America was. And are we losing some of what made America great? And are we trying to claw back some of those things that made America great? I think that's, it's in this terrain that you see a lot, of, uh, a lot of that political division. I want to steer us in the direction of faith and your journey. But so um, as a transition, I would 
um, point out that Americans are more religious than people, certainly in other, than people in other Western democracies. Um, we go to church frequently. We are accustomed to public expressions of faith. We even put God on our dollar bills and in the Pledge of Allegiance. So do you find it surprising that two of the leading candidates, even at this early stage, are such secular characters, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump? Not really, because I think there's um, so much of what's embedded into, uh, I don't know, the divine aspects of our republic. Um, I don't know, our, for a lot of people are sort of taken for granted or are anachronistic. You know, even the very notion that our country was divinely inspired and that our, our founding documents were, were divinely inspired tends to be a more polarizing position, certainly religiously, um, and even just in our Americanness, I think we're much more secular. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I think, look, we, we, we are um, a deeply religious country, but we're also really fractured in that sense. I mean, a lot of our big institutions are far more secular, and I think a lot of people who are people of faith feel more marginalized in our culture because of the you know, the secular overtones of it. And I think, you know, for me, I wrote the book and called it an unlikely spiritual journey for a couple of reasons. One, there's not a, I don't know a lot of people kind of in my walk in life, you know, Jewish from Los Angeles and spent my whole career in media who are running toward God. Um, you know, there's not a great deal of company in that space, um, particularly being Jewish. Uh, the notion of talking about God more often and, and really seeking a spiritual connection, even that is, is uh, more different um, for a lot of Jews. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm not surprised by the secular nature of it, and yet it's an area of real inquiry for me because I feel like we could do a better job of talking about faith and politics. We could do a better job of talking about one's inner life in the political sphere without it becoming so divisive. Uh, you know, I read the interview of you uh, by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic in which he asked you about the anti-piousness of journalists, and then I was yeah. thinking about it and I thought of, well, George Stephanopoulos is the son of a Greek Orthodox priest, and Mike McCurry is not a journalist, but he's now teaching religion, and Cokie yeah. Roberts wrote a book about their Passover Seder. So, but um, <laughs> uh, I just add that parenthetically. So, in your book, you describe uh, a CEO who turned to faith as a result of tragedy in his life. Yeah. Um, you also say about yourself, I actually believe that my success was an obstacle to my spiritual growth. Why do people turn to faith when they're faced with difficulty, even tragedy, and they turn away when things are going well? Wouldn't you think it would be the opposite? Well, perhaps it should be the opposite. I mean, I think, um, you know, humility and faith in, in, um, in seeking a divine experience is to really is to engage in, in, in a kind of submission and a kind of uh, an humility before God, however you understand God, and, a, and, and gratitude um, for the world that's created around us and for us uh, being created and all the gifts we have in our life. So I think it should be the opposite. But I think that we, in times of pain, uh, we seek, as the Psalms say, we know that you know, God is close to the brokenhearted and and, uh, and, and is close to those who are broken in spirit. And I think it's more of a natural reaction to say, I'm in some kind of pain, I need help. You know, again, as the Psalms say, from where will my help come from? It will come from, um, from the Lord, from uh, the creator of the world. So I just think that there's that, that natural inclination. We tend to take a lot of things for granted. In my own case, I think I was engaged in deepening my faith in a more intellectual pursuit. Um, and in that began out of a real place of gratitude for my life and a, and, a, and a spiritual yearning. And when I speak in these terms, by the way, this is language that I attach to it now that I didn't used to attach to it. So in other words, I think people experience spiritual longing, whether you use that vocabulary or not. So if any of us are going through life thinking, well, you know, what else is there? You know, who am I? Who should I be? What really gives me a sense of meaning and purpose in my life, in my work, in my parenting, in my, in my relationships? That to me is a spiritual longing. And I pursued all of that, um, but for me, I think my faith deepened, became more grounded as I became more humble and I experienced humiliation and humility and got a sense of a reordering of my life and a reordering of my loves in life um, to see that, you know, 
despite the fact that I was on television, that my life is pretty small, you know, compared to the grand scheme of things. You, you do write very honestly and, and movingly about uh, what a blow it was to lose your job yeah. at Meet the Press. Uh, but you also wrote, here was the time for me to live out so many of the lessons I'd been learning on my spiritual journey. Now was the time to walk the walk. So tell us how you've been doing. Well, I think there were phases to it. I mean, I think initially I was facing a lot of scrutiny. You know, I was on television and things weren't going well where our ratings were down. And I had, you know, people internally, you know, wanted my job and, and there were leaks in the media. And so it was just the kind of ugliness of TV news. Um, and I made a decision then that, that I really wanted to try to stay above the fray, that I wanted to be, um, you know, classier in that respect uh, for myself and for my children. And even in losing my job, um, I remember we had, were picking up our kids from uh, summer camp in New Hampshire, and the news was leaked by NBC about what was going on, and I was there to see reunite with our kids and so forth, so I was kind of working on these parallel tracks at the same time, and uh, you know, I tweeted out my response to what had happened and tried to stay classy about it and, and not engage in, in any of the, the back and forth, which I wanted to do, but in part that was also about what was the lesson that I wanted to teach my kids about this moment. And you know, struggling with how do you tell your children that you've lost your job? And we are, we're driving uh, away from camp the next day, and Matt Lauer calls me, and I tell the story in the book, and he calls to just express his regret about what had happened and how it had happened and so forth. And my oldest son, who's 13, he said, Daddy, who was that? I said, well, that was Matt Lauer. And he said, why is he calling you? <laughs> uh, and they gave me an opportunity to say, you know, because I'm no longer going to be doing this job. And... Uh, and, and then your daughter said, Daddy, did you get fired? And she said, and, and, I, you know, and I said, because I didn't get fired, and, and I felt like I was getting fired, and I certainly felt like I was going to get fired, but I had really kind of pressed the issue, and, and they were not committing to me. And I said, no. I said, but I want to be clear that, um, because I didn't do anything wrong, I said, but I wanted to be clear that they wanted someone else to do the job. And I said, you've seen one aspect of my job, the celebrity, people want my autograph, they tell me inexplicably that they love me. Uh, they want my picture. I said, well, there's another side to it, which is there you can be publicly criticized and have to go through all of that. So um, anyway, I had a certain amount of perspective, but I also have to be honest that I really struggled with the identity piece. You know, I felt that I had this kind of under control because I was on a faith path and I kind of had it all covered, and I didn't. You know, the blow of losing my job and losing that sense of who I was was tremendous. And it was something that I'd built up since I was 18, and unfortunately, there was a sense of, uh, you know, what some theologians talk about as the false self, you know, the, who the ego tells you you are. And I really struggled with the idea of, well, if I'm, not, if I'm not this guy who's on television, then do I matter? Do I have standing? Does anyone really care about me and what I have to say? And I think for younger people in the room, it's important to think about that because as you're building, you know, if you're like me, I was sharing with a, a, a smaller group earlier, I was so ambitious and I was on a path since I was 18 years old, I engineered myself to be what I became. But in the process, I think my identity became too much about that, as is so often the case. Um, and so losing that was a tremendous blow. I made mistakes, my faith did not always hold me. But in those moments, faith also taught me a lot. It taught me about grace, it taught me about humility, it taught me about um, understanding kind of the true, the true nature of my identity, who I am and who I want to be. And it really did help me gain a different kind of perspective. Above all, that, that we're all vulnerable. I think that's really important. I think so much of humility is to understand vulnerability. That we are all so close to losing our temper, to losing our job, to saying something unkind, to becoming too selfish, to becoming self-absorbed, to forgetting about those who are most vulnerable. We are all, because you know, life is noisy, and it will, we can fill our, our, our vessels up with uh, our own concerns and lose sight of a lot of things. Carrying around a sense of vulnerability and humility, uh, that, above all, has changed me. Well, I have to say the honesty uh, that you bring to this, your story in the book was really classy and really quite moving. Thank you. Um, so tell us um, why, why you chose the, the title, How's Your Faith? And 
an unlikely spiritual journey. It's really, how's your faith? Tell us that story. Yeah, so this was a question that President Bush asked me on numerous occasions. The, 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 the one occasion after I'd gotten the job at Meet the Press, I remember going to see him in the Oval Office, and he was just standing there waiting for me. He said, stand up straight, girls. Here he is. Meet the Press. <laughs> We, and we had, we had a good repartee between us, and we had a good relationship. And he was talking about you know, me getting the job here. He was talking about the economy. He talked about scrutiny that I'd face. And he, said, um, and he said, Gregory, how's your faith? And he'd asked me the question before. He knew that I was studying with a Jewish educator who I write about. Her name is Erica Brown. He knew that there was a, a group of journalists with whom I studied as well occasionally. Um, and, you know, obviously he'd been on his own faith path, but the directness of the question was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. Uh, and again, it's kind of startling if you think about asking or journalists who's covering you that kind of question. It may seem inappropriate, but it was not to me. He knew the context, and I welcomed the question. But the reason the, reason the question stuck with me was that I considered it an invitation to examine myself. Because you say, you know, how is your faith? Is it as strong as it was when you were growing up? Did you lose your faith? Where is your faith the strongest? And most importantly, would your, would your life be different if your faith were stronger? Um, those, I think, became really penetrating questions and ones that, for me, uh, created a space to examine myself that I thought was uh, really meaningful. And uh, again, you know, just an unusual circumstance. It's just not often that a president of the United States asks you such a question. So you concluded you could only find answers to the questions you were asking in the search for God. Yeah. Um, many people are on spiritual journeys, but it doesn't necessarily take them in that, along that path. Why did it lead you on a search for God? You know, I, I just, um, I believe that it's certainly embedded in our Jewish tradition that we seek a relationship with God. You know, the Psalms talk about seeking my face, seeking God's face, to seek a more intimate relationship with God, where God is, again, however you understand God, is a force of inspiration in our lives, um, a, a kind of, uh, of an intimate companion who inspires us to be who God intends for us to be. So for me, as opposed to a purely humanist approach, um, I really was drawn to the idea of studying in, within Judaism God's law, God's you know, ethical uh, constructs um, and example. But then even outside of the Jewish tradition, thinking about the concept of grace and God kind of being active inside all of us. Uh, in a way that we would seek to imitate and that might inspire our better behavior. That, to me, was the only natural ex expression of how do I find meaning and purpose in life? What does it mean to be a person of faith? What does it mean to, um, to have a sense of purpose through faith? And for me, it all comes down to nearness to God, to divine closeness. I think that you see that throughout sacred texts. I think we see this throughout uh, traditions, Judaism and Christianity and, and Islam. The nearness to God is something that I find important, I find inspirational, and I think it's a relationship that takes work, but it's, um, to me, a transcendent relationship um, that's very powerful. I want to ask you one last question before I turn it over to all of you, and it's, it's, it's in a completely different direction, so you'll excuse me, but I really have wanted to ask you this, because in 1997, you covered the trial of Timothy McVeigh, yeah. um, which uh, up until that point was the worst terrorist attack on U.S. soil. It killed 168 people, 19 children, injured 500. Then you were the chief White House correspondent when the planes hit the Twin Towers on September 11th. And most recently, the most recent experience that Americans have had with terrorism is what happened in San Bernardino. So you've had an interesting vantage point for these three incidents. How has America responded differently to each of them? Well, I think in the first two, there was a kind of uh, innocence that was shattered. You know, the, the McVeigh and Nichols bombing of the Oklahoma City uh, federal building was... Um, 
was so disturbing because we just hadn't seen something like that before. And of course, the natural instinct was that it was foreign terrorism. And to think that that could be produced out of our own midst, I think, was incredibly jarring. And it was really, you know, the, the, the people of Oklahoma City, I was just there talking about my book at the, at the memorial. Uh, and it's where I met my wife, who prosecuted the McVeigh and Nichols. Um, you know, they're, they're just incredibly gracious people who went through that pain and have also kind of found the best in themselves. I think so much was true as well after 9-11. I mean, I can just remember, and for the younger people here, you're probably too young, but it was an amazing experience. The sense of vulnerability that we had as Americans and the, the, the closeness that we felt to one another. I remember convening with friends after we all got back into town and hugging them. And, and being so sad and just so um, traumatized by what had happened to us as a country, um, I, 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 I wish that day had never happened. But at the same time, to experience that kind of closeness is also a, such, a, such a soothing balm in a time of such polarization. It shows you what we're capable of. In San Bernardino, I think we're living through something different. There's still that kind of grace that you see in, in our humanity in terms of how we respond. But I think it very quickly gets caught up in a political vortex now of what we're not doing, of the danger that we are not yet confronting, that we know this enemy and are we willing to call uh, it by its name, and that it's kind of metastasizing in a way where it's creeping into our streets in a, in a less spectacular and more... Uh, menacing kind of way, uh, that there's this kind of danger lurking in our midst as opposed to you know, coming on an airplane from the outside. Um, and, and so in that way, it's, it's, I think, ripping parts of our society apart a little bit more and making us think about security um, in, a, in a different way. So there are the three things that could be different. It could be the underlying circumstances, which is, yeah. I think, what you said. It could be this the American, where the American psyche is, or it could be leadership. And in 9-11, we had a leader who brought us together, and at the Oklahoma City, we did too. I'll yeah. leave that as a question. I'm not, I'll leave that in the air, because I really want to yeah. invite you all to Right, but it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Yes. Hi, my name's Tal Smith. I'm one of the Dean Salman students in Tisch College, and I work at MIU Journalism Institute as well. Uh, there's a new Quinnipiac poll today showing that Bernie Sanders actually beat GOP candidates in a hypothetical general election matchup uh, by margins of either four, by margins between four and ten points. Hillary Clinton time for losing um, to those same <coughs> candidates. Uh, you spent so much time, uh, especially in the mid 2000s, in a country that was seen, especially by conventional wisdom, as solidly center right. So um, looking back now and, and looking at the current presidential election landscape, what do you make of a self-proclaimed democratic socialist uh, polling so well against uh, pretty strident conservatives? I think he is a movement candidate. He's idealistic. He has uh, captured a spirit among parts of the electorate who feel left out of the political process, who feel disappointed with politics generally, maybe Obama specifically, who are, as I said before, deeply distrustful of big institutions. And he is different enough, angry enough, and willing to kind of call out the excesses in our economy in particular in a way that I think is appealing to a lot of people, and not just young people, but certainly to a lot of young people. So um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's significant. I do not yet believe that it's a signal of a movement to the country becoming center left. Um, I just don't believe that's the case. What I think it highlights is true inequality in our economy. Um, a, a, just a distinction in kind of in, in wealth and, and um, access to jobs and careers that heighten people's anxiety. I mean, I saw in the national poll, too, he's got more women who are voting for him. And, you know, some of this is about Hillary and the fact that she has yet to find the language of, of a movement, uh, being the first woman president. I think she's seen much more as a kind of, you know, part of the establishment, a part of the firmament, that it's not really um, 
It's not generating. Uh, one important thing to, to bear in mind, and that is that Bernie Sanders has not yet borne the brunt of the criticism that he will face. He hasn't yet from her, and nor from a Republican candidate. So he's in a little bit of that period of, of um, you know, of a uh, kind of honeymoon period where he's just he's drawing great crowds and he's um, and he is this this kind of movement politician and he's you know he's an appealing guy I mean he's he kind of runs counter to so many different conventions of the of a politician that it's it's kind of winning and um, I think that's all of those things are are in the mix right now. Thanks, Tom. I'm not going to have to call on people. <laughs> yes. So this was something that just kind of struck me as you started speaking about uh, Bernie Sanders. You kind of used similar language that you actually used when you were talking about uh, Trump earlier when you yeah. spoke. Do you consider them to be sort of products of similar frustration? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think they are similar because they're both way outside of the system. I mean, Sanders is actually in the system, but his ideas are, are a little bit farther outside the system. Um, he's he's a little bit more singularly focused than is um, Trump. But as Trump says, they kind of agree around one thing, which is there's a kind of brokenness in America, and, um, and they want to try to, to speak for those and deliver for those people who feel completely outside of the system, who feel that like, America is just completely off track. So yeah, I mean, I think there, there is a tremendous amount of populist connective tissue there. I mean, there's a lot of people on, you know, this Tea Party sentiment is, uh, is something that is shared with the populism on the left. They have different policy prescriptions, different views of what the government should do. But that sense of, of uh, being on the outside of a system that has nothing to show for its efforts, and it kind of churns along for itself and doesn't help people who are on the outside, that part of it, I think, is real. And it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's just being felt in a really um, powerful way. And I, I guess, to me, I didn't live through this, but the historical analogy is a little bit of the experience of the Vietnam War and how that kind of cleaved you know, uh, Americans from their government and created distrust and create a kind of dashed idealism. I mean, I think you know, there's some similarities around that in terms of economic existence, in terms of you know, college affordability. And, and I mean, I do think it's, it's not cynical, but it is, you know, you go around talking about free college education, you're going to get a lot of young people who are looking at the, the prospect of college debt and think, yeah, that's a cool idea. So I mean, I, you know, I get that, but it is, um, you know, it makes sense. Yes. So I was here in the 80s, uh, and I went to school with a lot of kids who were clearly being groomed to go into politics. They worked in the Hill, they worked for senators and congressmen. Afterwards, and never went into politics. And uh, I think my biggest frustration these days is that I feel like that the best and the brightest are not going into politics. And I think you're seeing some of that with other candidates. And do you agree with that, that thought? And I'm sure there's some terrifically bright people in this room who are concerned, and we'd love to see them go into politics. And what do you have to say? To and, and if I may, and many of them are. So you have to hang out on the campus of, of Tufts for a while. And You're not running for the, for the presidential election, unfortunately. Well, and, and give so them a little time. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point. I think, uh, look, I think people are turned off by politics thinking that it's not a place for, for <clears throat> men and women of principle and intellect and, um, and good values to survive, that the media climate is such, and that what it takes to get elected and stay in office uh, are the demands are such that, that it's simply not worth it. And I think that calculus has to change. You know, I mean, the greatness of, of Ted Kennedy was, I remember somebody saying to me, look, nobody was going to accuse him of selling out, you know, when he worked across the aisle on whether it was, now he regrets that he didn't pursue health care that Nixon was, uh, was uh, uh, pursuing, but when he worked with Bush on education reform, you know, he knew how to do that. And by the way, had he lived, I think health care reform would have passed differently, would have looked differently, and would have been a lot more politically durable than it is now. But that's because he was of an age when a legislator meant something and compromise meant something. I think we're all responsible collectively for how we judge and evaluate people in politics and these kind of purity tests that are applied to people and the way we de delegitimize political figures. And this kind of comes back to something I was talking about earlier, which is when we live in a climate where news and information can be used to validate our worldview, 
we're not challenging ourselves to think differently and to be open to different points of view. And I think that hurts the, the society. What I have always envied people um, who are in politics, who do get into politics, is something that was really different from my own path in journalism. I had a friend recently who worked in the uh, Bush White House, and she said, you know, she said, um, even in, you know, in the White House, yes, there's some competing visions and so forth, but you feel like you're part of a team. She said, in television, it really does seem about the in, like it's about the individual. I'm like, right. <laughs> yes, it is that, and, and, uh, and, and, and that's not a good thing. Um, the idea of being part of a team, I think, is so important, and I think we talk to, to young people about what, what career do you want, what job do you want to do. I do think it's really valuable to not just do as I did, which is to try to engineer the path for yourself and engineer your own career, but think about how do I become part of a team and how do I make really con good contributions? I said to my daughter, who goes to this very intense school in DC, Sidwell Friends, and she said, Daddy, um, you know, well, what about if, if I missed two questions, what would my score be on it? And I said, you know what, sweetheart? I said, I'm not concerned about what your grade is. What I'm concerned about is that you do your best, that you're trying hard, and maybe that means that you know, a B is bad. Maybe an A minus is bad. But I said, what I'm focused on is you focusing on having a sense of the information and being responsible and working hard. And I said, the rest of it will take care of itself. And I really, now I believe that more fervently than I ever did. But gosh, would I love her to absorb that message so she's not going around thinking about A. So I use that to say, I still think politics is a noble calling because it invites that kind of that team concept. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's really important. When should we send your daughter an application to Tufts? <laughs> <laughs> I think she's going to be highly qualified, I hope. I'd love to go back to your book for a minute. If, uh, and you write moving text for the book. Thank you. I appreciate that. You write movingly and very interestingly about intermarriage. Mm -hmm. And we're at a point in the Jewish community where more than 50% of Jews are intermarrying. And it's sort of time, I think, to look this not as a terrible challenge, but as an opportunity for inclusion and diversity. But the question is, how do you keep and value specific traditions while at the same time being open and loving and welcoming to members of your own family who are from very different traditions? Yeah, I think it's an important question. I, I think, first of all, what's important to point out is that, you know, in my case, my wife gave me a wonderful gift, which was the gift of, of being a Jewish family when she came from a very strong Methodist upbringing. And I was too ignorant and too selfish to recognize what a huge sacrifice that was. And I tell one brief story. I remember asking Rachel Cowan, my friend, why it is that I felt so emotional whenever my kids would light candles on Friday night and say the prayers. And she explained what I was experiencing with them was a, a soulful connection uh, that was being part of a story, a letter in the scroll, as Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes uh, about. Um, and that connection was deeper than mere pride. And I remember relating this to my wife, and she cried too, but for a different reason, because she said, I'll never have that with our children. Only you will have that. And, I, and, and there's, a, there's regret that she carries because of that. So my own walk in faith to become a, a person of deeper faith had to include honoring her traditions more and finding the language to help our kids understand that she's a Christian and what does that mean and what are the differences, but look how much we really share. And often, I, 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 and I think I'm being responsive to your question, it, which is there's too many Jewish families, especially older couples, who say, oh, my child, they're marrying out of faith, and I don't know what they're going to do, and this one is there, maybe they're going to be Catholic. And, and I say, and when I talk about the book, I say, look, stop talking about this in terms of us. And let's find a way to honor others. Let's find a way to honor our non-Jewish spouse, honor their commitment, their willingness to raise Jewish children, and find ways to honor their traditions as well, whether it's going to church with them or whether it's talking about uh, what we share in the Judeo-Christian background that is so similar. Um, and so I think, there's, I, think there's, uh, I think there's tremendous work to be done in that space. Um, so I think some of this is around language, some of it's around ritual. And some of it is, 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 um, uh, does not mean that we lose a commitment to the survival of the Jewish people. In other words, I recognize that for Jews, to marry out of faith gets to larger questions about how will Jews survive. And I, you know, I take that responsibility very seriously, which is why I've tried to educate myself and why I try to teach my children 
um, so that they, there is that, that measure of continuity. Does that get at some of the, yes. uh, yeah, thank you. You want, oh, Susan, the woman, in the, the beautiful woman in the front row. <laughs> um, in following up, here you are on a college campus uh, speaking to many students. And you came to your spirituality later in life. It wasn't during your college years. It was right. really a journey that took you well into your career, where, as you said, you had to find yourself that way. And you've learned to define yourself in a variety of ways, including your own spirituality. What do you say to the students here about their own journey? And you know, it's not an advice book of do this, do this, do this. But um, as people are seeking and are at a time in their life where they're saying, who am I? What am I doing? What am I being? Right. What, what would you say to people on this, on this kind of a journey here? <laughs> One of the things that I think I, I wish I had done more of in these years, even if it wouldn't have been you know, digging more deeply into my faith, is um, to, try to, to try to quiet the self inside of me, to try to, to channel ambition in a way that was not purely about my own aggrandizement. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I believe in confidence and commitment to a career path. You need that. It's a really dynamic world right now, and it's very competitive. But the quieting of the self, I think, invites a little bit more community. And I think through that, there's a way to open the heart a little bit. I think if you can, this, these are disciplines, and, they, and it does require learning, and it requires experience. But I had an interesting experience with Joel Osteen, of all people, right? I mean, here I am, a nice Jewish boy from the Valley in L.A., going to his mega church, And I didn't know what to expect. In part, I thought he would say, look, the answer to deepening your faith is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and, you know, be gone. And he was not that at all. And one of the things he said to me, he said, it's important to have a heart for God. And from an evangelical preacher, that may sound heavy-handed. It might find, sound offensive. I don't know how it lands on your ears. But it landed on my ears in a way that if you can open yourself up to experience, open yourself up to the divine, however you experience the divine, is in part a quieting of the self and leads you to a path of more compassion, more mercy, uh, more toward being a, a better version of yourself. And I think starting to get into those habits when you're young and single and on camp, you know, and, and, and a student begins to lay the groundwork for, um, for perhaps a, a deepening of this path as you get farther into life and perhaps you become married and, and if you have children, you start thinking about these things more deeply because the innocence of a child and this, this malleable person invites the question, as I said about my own job, which is what, what do I want to teach in this moment? Who do I ultimately want to be? If, 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 if I could help this child to be anything. And it's in those moments we think, oh yeah, I want to be my very best self. I want this child to be the very best herself. Um, so really doing the work to keep returning to those things. You know, in our daily, uh, I was just studying this with Erica Brown earlier today, in the daily prayers of Jews, the, the Amidah, there is a, uh, a prayer about repentance, which in Hebrew is teshuvah, which is to return. And the idea that God always wants us to return to return to his commandments, to return to God, which to me is a return to, to our best self, our best self. Um, and we're always in a process of that returning. So to begin to acquire that discipline and that commitment at an earlier age, it doesn't have to be so daunting. It can be, you can take smaller steps, but that returning to your best self, I think is a really, it's a good way to think about it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sophia, I'm a senior, um, and my question is, I'll preface it with, I have not yet read your book, so you may touch okay. on it, um, but for, on your spiritual journey, um, so there was talk about the religiousness of American society, and I find that depending on where you are, um, as a religious person, you might find a lot of resistance, especially in like, very educated places where people yeah. may be more secular. And so as you were on your personal journey, did you find any pushback from friends, family, colleagues? And what did that look like, and how did you deal with it? I actually, I, I really didn't. Um, I was pleasantly surprised about that. Um, I mean, I've had to learn to kind of calibrate, I guess, 
what I say and where I say it. Um, but I think people have generally been supportive. I mean, I've only, I was interviewed once uh, for New York Magazine, who it was clear that the, the writer in question was not really on a spiritual path and didn't really understand <laughs> mine. But aside from that, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think there's... Um, you know, there can be a danger in a kind of heavy-handedness of faith, or even in God-saturated talk. Now, I look, I, this is not how I grew up. I mean, I would have never expressed myself and talked about divine closeness and nearness and honesty. I mean, and I even know how that must sound to certain people who aren't there. Believe me, I get it. Um, but I only do so now because I re it really is authentic for me, and it comes from a place of deep conviction. And... Um, that said, my wife, who inspired this whole thing, says, oh, my God, you talk about God so much. <laughs> Just tone it down a little bit. And I, and I, and I do like to find a way. I'm, I, sometimes I hesitate. I mean, I use divine other than God. I, 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 I try to work on it. I, I, I sometimes am in deliberately being provocative, because especially around Jews, I like to use more God-saturated language, because I think we should, and because I think Jews just... Uh, don't talk about God enough, but that's more of a kind of inside the community thing. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's just generally been um, welcome. I'm not. The, here's here's something I think is really important. Like, I am not a faith leader. I am not a theologian, and I have not achieved any kind of mastery over this. Um, you know, I, I, I in fact. Part of that vulnerability I speak of is that the more I have tried to deepen my path, the more exposed I feel and the more vulnerable I feel because my weaknesses are just so present for me. So the good thing is I'm not in denial. But the bad thing is that I am confronted by how often I fail and how I'm stumbling along this path. Um, so there's no sense, there is no self-righteousness in that respect. Um, and... Uh, so I hope that that is in part, um, you know, why the reception has been warmer. I think we only have time for one more question, and yes. Hi, my name is Maura. Hi. Um, I'm going to shift gears to ask you about journalism. Okay. So my question is, you've mentioned twice now how harsh the world of TV journalism is. Yes. So my question is, why TV? And then the follow-up question is, why a podcast now? Well, that's just one of the things I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm back on television. I've been doing a lot with CNN and Fox, and you'll see more of that. Um, and no, I mean, television for me is my most natural state and what I like. Uh, but why did I get into TV uh, initially? Just because I, I mean, oh, why is TV so nasty? Or why? Yeah. Um, why is it so nasty? Yeah, well, there's lots of... Um, yeah, just higher egos, being on TV and celebrity, and I think it's you know, just kind of a more central place in our culture. Um, you know, for me, it was just I thought a kind of an obvious extension of my uh, skill set and being able to communicate and talk. And uh, my father was a Broadway producer, and my mother was a performer, so those were kind of natural things for me and a natural extension. And um, I really enjoy being on television, and I enjoy. Um, I used to joke that I didn't understand how people would measure productivity in their lives if they weren't on television. That if you that if you if you went to meetings and you did things again, how do you measure what you've produced as opposed to how often you are on television? Um, and that, that is that is of course ridiculous. Um, but but I only say that partially in jest. Um, so I really I really did so so just kind of a. It's something that I've, I've really enjoyed and being able to share that and being able to connect with people that way has always been meaningful um, for me. Um, uh, you know, the podcast is interesting because, you know, this has become kind of in vogue now and I'm still, we're, we're fiddling around a little bit with the name, whether it's off camera or the follow-up question, but they've been amazing experiences. You know, so much of what I experienced at Meet the Press was... <clears throat> You do an interview, even in a long-form interview, what you're filled with is a sense of what you have to do, what you have to ask this person to drive the story, to hold them accountable, to drive the news cycle. And I didn't get to do enough of what I wanted to do. You know, I could sit down, and I often do. I mean, I sit down without notes, and I just go. And I've, so far, we're going to launch this in March. I've interviewed Sam Harris on atheism. I've interviewed John Meacham on the nature of biography. And... 
Um, I've interviewed both other religious leaders, but also Kara Swisher, who runs Recode, um, who covers Silicon Valley. And uh, they've just been a lot of fun to do. I've learned things, and, I've, and Andy Cohen I've interviewed. I mean, I've just been able to have fun and, uh, and have a kind of freestyle kind of interview, which is something that I really liked. So, you know, I'm in the process of getting back to work and, and, and creating the next chapter for me, and I, I like that that's a, that's a part of it, and it's still unusual that it's not on camera. But there's no question that, you know, being on camera uh, creates a certain formality that's very, that you have to work really hard to get to something real. Um, and, and a podcast can pierce through that a little bit more easily. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you'll, hope you'll look for it and tell your friends. I don't want to embarrass my wife by asking you to explain exactly what a podcast is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell yeah, me yeah. later. Um, <laughs> David, be, uh, we, we never let anybody leave without a gift or two. I love gear. I hope it's uh, Well, it gear. is. It is. There's, um, <clears throat> there's a bunch of gear. Oh, good. So... First of all, we wanted something for your head. <laughs> I don't know if you're a Redskin fan or what, but you know we are. Washington gets cold, so here's it. a jumbo hat. I love it. Um, I have to. I, I feel ignorant, but I didn't know about the whole jumbo P.T. Barnum history. But I am. I am. I'm all about it. So <laughs> um, I will absolutely wear this. Thank you. Uh, this is a pretty big cup for your coffee. Hello. Can I just say? So I have actually like gotten cheesier as I've gotten older, and I am super into coffee mugs. Oh. And I was just on, and this is fantastic, by the way, and it's, and it's quite large. I was on Fox <laughs> News Sunday uh, the other day, and they give out not a coffee mug, but a hot tub. The coffee mug is like this big, and uh, anyway, at home I get a lot of heat for whether I'm, you know, like they say about the budget, if you're going to spend something, you have to give something up, so I have to give them up. So, uh, this is fantastic. Well, don't, bathe, don't bathe in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, while well, we're still giving you things for your head. So these are two books written by uh, the dean of the Fletcher School. I don't know if you ever got to meet Admiral Jim Stavridis. He was the supreme ah, allied great. commander. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful guy. And he's, this is a great book about leadership. And uh, he's not here, but tell him I was... And <laughs> plug in the book. And then um, the Associate Dean of Research at Tisch College, one of the nation's leading authorities on uh, civic life and uh, the participation of young people, wrote this wonderful book, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America. Great. So we'd like to have Thank you. Some, from some of Thank Tufts' you leading much. intellectuals. Wonderful. Um, David will sign uh, copies of his book in the back. They are all paid for, so you don't have to worry, courtesy of Tisch College. And I just want to thank you, David, for joining us. Thank it's been you fascinating. very much.